Well, hello again, this is Dr. Michael Bogart of Aspect Ministries, where we are all about promoting effective 21st century faith. In my previous videos explaining the historical and cultural aspects of the Chosen series, we have explored Jewishness, the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament portions of the Bible. We've looked at the oral law, which even consistent Bible readers often don't fully understand. We've talked about the central importance of the Sabbath and the array of Jewish groups that Jesus dealt with, Pharisees, Sadducees, and so forth. I've also shared why I, as a fan of The Chosen, am doing these explainer videos. And that is the fact that 20 centuries have come and gone since Jesus' time, and many layers of culture and language now separate us from what's recorded in the Gospels. And I might add that in the 21st century, fewer and fewer people have even a surface familiarity with the Bible, or with the life of Jesus, for that matter. So naturally, they struggle with understanding the customs and historical setting that come with any depiction of the gospel accounts. Also, if you're wondering about my qualifications on the subject, I hold an earned doctorate in education that involves research into cross-cultural learning. My research grew out of my experience teaching the Bible to Christian leaders in several venues in developing countries around the world. And at the same time, I've been a part-time teacher in secular colleges and universities for 30 years here in the United States. So I do have some knowledge not only of the Bible, but also of how information is transferred and learning happens across cultures. All right, with that background, let's move into the topic for this episode of Making Sense of the Chosen. We'll look at the hated Roman occupation of Jerusalem and surrounding regions. So hang on, I'm going to give you a quick running start for those who may be a bit shaky on their Roman history. So according to legend, Rome was founded in 753 BC on the Tiber River by the twins Romulus and Remus of the Latin tribe. At first the city was ruled by a succession of seven kings. The later ones were not even Latin but were Etruscans from just north of Rome. The Etruscan kings oppressed the Latins, and after a tragic incident involving the rape and death of a virtuous Latin woman, the Latins revolted, ending the monarchy and establishing the Roman Republic. The Republic lasted until the first century BC. During the era of the Republic, Rome steadily conquered new lands. First they consolidated their control over all of Italy. Then after the Punic Wars with Carthage to the south, Rome acquired lands in North Africa as well. And toward the end of the Republic, lands in France, Spain, and Egypt were merged into Rome's growing domains. Greece fell to the Romans in the 140s BC, and the vast Greek-dominated lands of Palestine and Syria followed in due course. The rise of Julius Caesar is a sort of pivot in Roman history. His dictatorship marked the end of the Republic and the beginnings of the imperial rule, which actually was established in 27 BC under his nephew Augustus. Now the empire would last until around 475 AD when the western provinces, Italy, Spain, France, and Britain collapsed and the Dark Ages began. But Rome wasn't finished just yet. The Roman Empire would carry on in the east as the Byzantine Empire until 1453 AD when the Turks captured Constantinople and brought most of what had been the eastern Roman lands under the rule of Islam. Okay, let's go back to the Roman occupation of the Holy Lands themselves. In 64 BC, to complete the conquest of the Greek-dominated Middle East, Rome sent an envoy named Pompey to organize Syria into a province. Rome was very interested in this part of the Middle East, not only for the trade and revenue it would produce, but also to serve as a buffer between them and the rival Parthian Empire to the east. Now, we know Parthia as Persia or modern Iran. Turmoil among the Jews to the southwest of Syria prompted Pompey to move against Jerusalem. And after a brief siege, Jerusalem and the surrounding area of Judea were annexed by Rome in 63 BC. Here's a Roman coin minted for the very purpose of boasting about their most recent conquest. See the Jewish woman weeping underneath the palm tree with the Roman soldier standing triumphantly behind her? What arrogance! But then again, that was Rome for you. Now once Rome assumed control over the Holy Land, there was a frantic jockeying for power by a number of people, among them with the wealthy and powerful family of Antipater. 
Antipater's family were of Edomian descent. Bible readers know them as the Edomites. The family of Antipater had been converted to Judaism, though, in the second century BC. And in 40 BC, Antipater's son Herod, today known as Herod the Great, managed somehow to get himself appointed by the Roman overlords as king of the Jews. And this was ironic since, as I mentioned, the family was not really ethnically Jewish at all. But Herod ruled well on behalf of the Romans. His territory was extensive, all of modern Israel plus parts of modern Jordan and Syria. And when Herod died in 4 BC, his territory was split up. Herod's death was only a year or two after his despicable killing of the infants of Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth. The Romans had learned, though, that with all of the ethnic rivalry in the region, it was not wise to have a single person controlling such a large area, even if that person claimed loyalty to the empire. So they divided Herod's territory into four parts. One of Herod's sons, Archelaus, received two of the parts, which included Judea, Samaria, and Edomia. That would be central and southern Israel today, plus the West Bank and part of Jordan. The other two parts were further north and were ruled by Herod's remaining sons, Philip and Herod Antipas. I know, way too many Herods, but that's another issue. Now, the elder son, Archelaus, was an utter disaster. He was stupid, cruel, and incompetent. And the people of the region finally appealed to Rome for relief, which for once Rome granted by removing him in 6 AD. But instead of finding a successor, they simply merged the territories into a single district called Judea and sent a Roman governor or prefect to rule it directly. And with no client king in between, Rome could levy taxes and make laws as they pleased and they got right down to business. Luke chapter 2 records that Quirinius, the governor of Syria, had ordered a census around 5 BC that would ultimately form the basis for these future taxation programs in the region. That was the event, by the way, that forced Joseph and Mary to leave their homes in Nazareth and make the arduous journey to their ancestral town of Bethlehem, where they could be accurately counted. Now, how did the Romans treat the religions of the people that they conquered? Well, believe it or not, the Romans considered themselves to be religiously tolerant. Of course, they had their own gods and goddesses, you know, Jupiter, Venus, Minerva, Mars, etc. However, by the time of the empire, they had encountered many other religions as they conquered more and more people. So the Roman policy was simply to leave local religions alone, for the most part, as long as they posed no threat to Rome's power. But the Jews were unique in Rome's experience. They found the Jews to be troublesome and unreasonable on religious matters since they firmly stuck to their faith in a single creator God and they rejected the pantheon of gods that Rome and other peoples were familiar with. Even so, they mostly allowed the Jews to rule themselves on religious matters. But when it came to political matters, though, Rome was firmly in charge, and that included the exclusive right to execute criminals and subversives. So with a Roman governor resident in Jerusalem, or sometimes in the Roman-built coastal city of Caesarea Maritima, the Jews had very little power over their own destiny. The governor maintained a large garrison of troops stationed in Jerusalem. The headquarters, the Antonia Fortress, dominated the landscape directly overlooking the sacred Jewish temple. This in itself was an insult to the Jews. Guards in the towers of the Antonia Fortress could actually look down on what the Jews were doing in this sacred place, the temple. And the eagle standards of Rome rose above that sacred place. Now, there were also smaller garrisons in market towns, keeping an eye on things and even oppressing the people. The Romans recruited local Jews, for instance, to collect Roman taxes and to inform on their neighbors if they were suspected of being subversive. Within certain fairly wide limits, Roman soldiers could intimidate and beat up local people if they felt disrespected or threatened in the least. They could also harass women if they were so inclined and could engage in extortion and bribery, again, within certain limits. As you can imagine, the Jews wanted their country back. They wanted the right to rule themselves without outside interference. And they were often afraid that their homes and businesses could very easily be entered and violated as well. Here's an example from The Chosen, Season 1, Episode 7. I am ready to leave this place, Nico. 
I miss my children and my grandchildren, including the one I haven't even met yet. Oh, so horrible. You can't just barge. Oh, I believe I can. Printer Quintus. So horror, is it? Pleasure to see you again. I trust all is well. Why would you trust that? Oh, yes, please, do make yourself at home. We really will have to discuss the people's tithing. <laughs> this is why you've come? I need to know if we have a problem, Nicodemus. I have complied with every request Rome has made to my office, even when it infringed on custom. Let me rephrase. You and I want the same thing. We want rules followed. We want order. See what I mean? And who were these Romans anyway? Of course, there were the actual Romans, you know, people from Rome and the surrounding regions of Italy. But by the first century AD, the term Roman had become pretty elastic. Roman could actually mean anyone who was part of the Roman system, anyone who served the empire. And that could include people from lands that no one today would think of as Roman. Spain, France, the Balkans, parts of North Africa, even Britain, which by Jesus' time had already been invaded once by Rome, but would not become a Roman province until 43 AD. So Roman soldiers and Roman officials could come from any of these places. They were simply cogs in the machine of empire. To many Jews of Judea and Galilee, it seemed that the world in the form of the Roman Empire had descended upon them to oppress and destroy them. No wonder so many longed for a Messiah to come and drive the hated Romans away. So how did the Romans affect Jesus and his ministry? Well, we know that he interacted with Romans on a couple of occasions at least. For instance, in Matthew 8, a Roman centurion who had heard about his miracles met Jesus as he entered the city of Capernaum. He begged Jesus to heal his servant who was gravely ill. And when Jesus offered to go to the Roman's home, the centurion declined, saying that he only had to speak and the healing would happen. Jesus' reaction? Truly I tell you, he said, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. So Jesus was actually impressed with Romans, interested in them and their problems, and of course, in their redemption. And as you may remember, it was the Roman governor and a Roman execution detachment who crucified him. We'll talk about that in a future video. Overall, though, Jesus didn't seem to be as troubled by the Roman occupation as many other Jews were of his day. When confronted by that famous trick question, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not, Jesus simply replied, if it's Caesar's, give it to him but be sure to give to God what belongs to him. So it seems that getting rid of the Romans was clearly not uppermost on Jesus' mind. And I think it was because of this lack of urgency to get rid of the Romans that Jesus was deeply disappointing to many Jews of his day. Contrary to their hopes, he did not raise an army and drive the Romans out. And in their minds, this was the main thing that Messiah would do, defeat Israel's enemies and reestablish the glory days of David and Solomon's rule. And Jesus' message of an inner kingdom that would eventually spread to cover the whole earth didn't resonate with a lot of folks. They weren't looking to make a fundamental inner change in themselves. They just wanted a political solution, a military solution, an outward solution. They simply wanted Jesus to change their circumstances, but leave them alone in their own tendencies to dominate others and seek their own welfare at others' expense, the very things that the Romans were guilty of. What most Jewish people of the day expected was immediate relief so they could simply get on with their own lives. In the end, Jesus lost the support of the crowds who had at one time flocked to see his miracles and listen to his accessible teaching. So Jesus lost his short-lived popularity. In the end, there was actually one thing the Romans and many of the Jewish leaders of the day could agree on. Jesus had to go. One last detail about the Roman occupation of the Holy Land. It ended badly for the Jews. No surprise there, I guess. 
In 66 AD, there finally was an uprising against Rome. The Romans put it down ruthlessly, of course, including a year-long siege of Jerusalem, the killing of thousands, and the destruction of the temple, stone by stone, just as Jesus predicted in Matthew 24. The surviving Jews licked their wounds for a generation or so, and then a man named Bar Kokhba led another uprising, which was obliterated by Rome in 135 AD. By this time, the Romans were fed up with the Jewish problem as they saw it. They rounded up the remaining Jews and deported them all over the Mediterranean world. And this dispersion followed a couple of other waves of Jewish dispersion. Since the 700s BC, for example, Jews had already been widely scattered across the world from Spain to India. Together, these dispersions were called the Jewish diaspora. But although there had already been some Jews in Europe for many years, the bulk of what we think of as European Jews originated from this final Roman deportation in the 130s AD. All right, in the next background video, I want to take a closer look at this very subject, the Jewish diaspora. Now, the widespread scattering of Jews around the world does play a role in the life of Jesus, but it will play an even bigger role in the book of Acts. The Jewish diaspora prepared the way for the enormous and relatively rapid spread of Jesus' message in the early days. And in the meantime, don't forget to check out my other videos on YouTube, like my five-minute Bible guides in which I give simple but impactful chunks of information about the Bible and related topics. Also, take a quick moment to visit the undiscoveredbible.com website, where you'll find an array of helpful and thought-provoking articles, media, and more. The undiscoveredbible.com site does just that. It uncovers things that people who even read the Bible never thought of. It never occurred to them because they don't understand the culture and the times. It's almost like we try to bring an aha moment to every episode that we produce. I think you'll really be impressed, especially with the first one about Gilgal. I'll give you a hint. It's called Footprints of Faith. Well, I hope my insights in this episode have been enlightening and have deepened both your appreciation and your enjoyment of the Chosen series. It would help me greatly if you'd be so kind as to like and subscribe to this channel. And until next time, this is Dr. Michael Bogart with Aspect Ministries. See you then.